All right, guys, this is the second organic chemistry video, and it's going to be a little bit different from, from some of the other ones. Um, I've actually edited a video that I made last year, and I had a bunch of really good questions asked by some of my kids, and so I made this video for them. Um, it's going to include some biology, some biochemistry, and some more naming. I'm also going to be using a program called ChemDraw, uh, which lets me put together some molecules pretty quick. So pause it as you need to, get what you can out of it, um, but it, this is just a kind of extra explanation, tie some loose ends up kind of video. So there's no um, notes that go with this. Just watch the video, take notes as you go, and you should be fine. All right. So it'll cut to a different version of me, and we'll go from there. So you probably did in biology, right? Uh, the four macromolecules. I, I know that you did. I, I teach bio, or I used to teach biology, so I know it's. I know that's on the curriculum, okay. And when you learn about that kind of stuff, it's it's tough for a bio kid to to kind of understand what's going on with that because you learn it at the very beginning of the year. You may have never been exposed to any chemistry before, um, but you know they throw stuff at you and they say things like this. They say, you know, carbs are organic compounds made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. OK. Um, and they talk about how they're used in the cell and, and you know, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, that sugars and, you know, starches are both forms of carbs. And they talk about that. And then they show you this picture. Right. And they say, hey, this this is a carbohydrate. And they draw it as a straight chain. And then they tell you, oh, by the way, it's a hexagon. And they don't really give you a, a whole lot of um, information going with that. OK. So something that I want to point out to you guys is that when you're learning organic chemistry, it's almost impossible to learn it without thinking of some biological molecules, all right? So just to show you a few of those, all right? Um, this is my ChemDraw application that we talked about in the other lab, or in the other lecture. Uh, and if we go through and we look at some things from biology, like maybe a phospholipid, you know, um, cell membrane okay so our cell membranes are phospholipids and this is usually how they draw them in biology right they give you a, a phosphate head a lipid tail they say hey the middle is hydrophobic it doesn't like water uh, they say that the you know the head is hydrophilic it likes water um, and they don't really give you uh, too much to go on with that but if we actually pull one of these. Let me find my little picture here. I got a whole bunch of them for today. Um, if we actually look at what one of those guys look like. Oh, where'd it go? Give me just a second. I lost it. Go figure. So I will resort to the internet so I can pull this picture up. Okay, uh, here we go. If we copy this image, paste. No. Oh my God, stop doing that. <laughs> I don't want a PLC paint. All right, hold on. We have. Lost Kim Draw. Kim Draw's losing its mind. No, okay, let's try this again. Two for some reason. There are. I don't know why it's drawing TLC plates, kids. Never had that happen before. Okay. Quick, fix it. There we go. Maybe. Hey, there we go. Okay. Ah, oh, it's always something. Smaller. There we go. Okay. 
So they draw, back to what we were saying, they draw those uh, phospholipids as a, uh, you know, a ball with a squiggly line. <clears throat> and they say, hey, this part is hydrophobic, this part is hydrophilic. Well, when in all actuality, this, this molecule here to the left, this is what a phospholipid looks like, okay? Um, and some things that we want to point out from that that I'm, I'm hoping you're getting in the reading, all right, first of all, this, this region down here uh, is a branch chain, or sorry, is an unbranched chain, all right, of saturated hydrocarbons, right? We know that, um, you know, these, each one of these joints is a carbon, okay, and each one of those has enough hydrogens to give the carbon four bonds. So in the middle here, each carbon has two. On the end, they have three hydrogens. And so these long chains here are alkanes, right? And you know from your reading, alkanes are nonpolar, they're hydrophobic, they don't mix well with water, right? Um, and then something else that they talk about, right, when they talk about um, lipids is they say, you know, oh, there's our triglycerides, so my bio kids get to see it at least. Um, they say, hey, you know, we have these triglycerides, and, you know, what's the difference between a triglyceride and a, and a lipid? Well, easy. A, a lipid ha or a phospholipid, rather, has the two tails. A triglyceride will have three. A phospholipid has this phosphate head, right? We see PO4 right there. That's the polyatomic ion you guys memorized, um, <clears throat> where a triglyceride will have a glycerol head, okay? So just to connect a couple things for you, um, I thought it would be worthwhile to, to look into that. Okay, so something else you might see is with sugar, all right? And so back to this slide, right? They show you this, this picture of sugar, um, and they've got all these OH groups on there, those hydroxyls. Those uh, hydroxyls are actually really important. Um, and not to get way over your heads, but um, without those hydroxyls, you can't actually uh, build up glycogen, or you know, which is a string of glucose. You can't make starch. Um, you, you know, you got to be able to cleave some of those carbon-carbon bonds and move those hydroxyls around. Now, something that is important about those hydroxyls is they are polar side groups, right? So in the reading, it talks a little bit about functional groups. Uh, and, and a hydroxyl is actually a polar side group, okay? So um, we see a lot of those polar side groups. We think, hey, that could be uh, miscible in water, right? That could dissolve. And sure enough, um, you know, glycogen, um, or well, glucose, anyway, the little teeny tiny subunits here of glycogen are, uh, are actually very water soluble, right? That's how we make sweet tea, uh, which is, you know, important. Something else, uh, and you're actually going to see a image of a sterol on the post check. Uh, this is a sterol. It has this ring system right here. Um, this in, in, you know, to be specific, this is cholesterol, but it is a sterol uh, molecule. It is also an organic compound. Okay, your proteins, which we talked about yesterday uh, or Monday in the office hours, whatever day it was, um, they are all organic molecules. Right and here, are all of the different amino acids. Okay, and maybe your teacher showed you uh, something like this in biology. Okay, and I'm, this is actually what I'm going to look at today. So let's see if I can get this thing to play. Maybe. Come on. Might work, might not. It's an old PowerPoint, so the link might be dead. Yeah, I think the link's dead. All right. Well, anyway, that's all right. I figured it would be, so I pulled one up myself. And I thought I would make it a little bit more interesting, since probably everybody in here has taken ibuprofen before. Um, when we talk about organic molecules and we talk about medicines, right, we talk about pharmaceuticals, um, just to, to kind of give you a taste of how complicated something like a medicine is, all right, let me show you um, an adipocyte, which is a human fat cell. Okay, let's go to the 3D view here. Oh, just start over. There we go. All right, and remember that um, wherever something binds, this is going to be a uh, protein, right? Um, and we show proteins as alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets. So you can see the beta sheet right there, 
Uh, you can see the Alpha Helix right here. Let me zoom in on this just a bit. Okay. And then there in the middle, you can actually see the ibuprofen molecule. That's the ibuprofen molecule. And in order for a drug to be effective, right, we talked a little bit about uh, pharmaceuticals the other day. In order for that drug to be effective, it has to be able to bind to a protein in the body and change it in some way. So if we look at how ibuprofen actually binds to our um, active site, right, the, the pocket in the enzyme, let's, let's pull up this a little bit here. Let's make it a little easier to see. And we'll go ahead and show a three-dimensional shape. Uh, maybe not quite that much. There we go. The three-dimensional shape of our enzyme, right? You can kind of see there. Uh, because enzymes are, you know, or chemicals are real things, right? They do have a structure. But you can see these amino acids. So like A75 is an amino acid. Um, you know, let's find another one that it's interacting with here. It has a label A33 there. Um, these amino acids have to interact with and bind or, you know, form some kind of bond with the actual chemical that you're looking at. So that gray thing right there, that's ibuprofen. Uh, and, you know, we can kind of come on, focus up here. There we go. As we zoom around, they'll move out of the way and you can see the binding. OK, so. You know, for a medicine to work, right, a lot of chemistry is in play. A lot of biology is in play. So when we talked about pharmaceuticals in the last lecture, uh, I wanted you to have some idea of what that looks like. Now, not all uh, drugs work the same way, like uh, ibuprofen, um, you know, it binds in this adipocyte. Uh, you know, something else like an antibiotic. So let me look up another antibiotic here. Uh, linezolid is a pretty um, interesting antibiotic, and it works by binding to the ribosomes of bacteria and prevents those ribosomes from making proteins. So if you think back to, you know, your biology class, um, when you learned about proteins, see if I can pull that slideshow back up. Uh, not this one. This is my other one. Don't save it. So if you think back to biology and how you make a protein, right, one of the things that you learn about with proteins um, are that they're formed on the ribosomes, right? Those are the little organelles that actually take your tRNA, read the, the codons in your mRNA, uh, and actually put together those amino acids to make a, a protein. So, you know, you see stuff like this in biology. You don't really go into great depth with it, um, but – and maybe you did if you took, you know, bio honors, but um, – when you actually look at what that what that means, right? So this is a ribosome, um, the 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 piece that linezolid binds to, okay? Uh, and you can see right down here in the middle is actually uh, the linezolid molecule, okay? Um, something that is interesting about the way this antibiotic works, all right, is it is only binding to the surface of the ribosome and actually blocks the tRNA from laying the next amino acid uh, into the active site. So, you know, if we look at the surface of the, of the ribosome, this colored region, uh, we can see that this ring, this hydrophobic ring right here on the antibiotic is actually the only thing that's forming a bond. Um, but if you could imagine this, I, I know this is kind of difficult to imagine, but right here is where the tRNA would actually lay the next amino acid because linezolid's in the way and it's bound, it blocks it. So when you talk about organic chemistry, uh, pharmaceuticals comes up a lot and, you know, drugs and how drugs work with the body come up a lot. And so I wanted to give you guys just a, a brief look at that um, to kind of give you a little bit of knowledge, okay? give you a little bit of exposure to something uh, that is, you know, an honors level discussion. All right. So that's, that's what I wanted to talk about as far as, um, the the medical part, all right, the the pharmaceutical part and that kind of thing that we talked about yesterday. Now, something else that is uh, pretty interesting from yesterday's discussion that once you get the hang of uh, becomes a whole lot easier um, is the naming of things, all right. And so, you know, when you name stuff, 
Um, there is a set of rules, the IUPAC rules, all right? And it's really, let's see here. I'm going to change something real quick. I'll put this over here. I'm going to share my other window. There we go. All right, now I can see what I'm doing. All right, so when you look at a molecule, right, let me zoom in and make this a little easier to see. Can you guys see this? Yes, sir, maybe. All right, remember, okay, good. So when you name a molecule, a couple things that you want to keep in mind. You always name the longest chain first. Now, this is a condensed drawing, right? I got to zoom out one or it gets finicky. So we're only showing the carbons and the hydrogens and all that, right? But let's clean it up the way it looks good. Now, if we actually look at this molecule, we can get the computer to name it. So this is 3-methylheptane. So let's make sure we understand why this is 3-methylheptane, okay? So let's break this down. Um, number one, we need to number our carbons, all right? And we always number them so that you get the longest parent chain uh, in, your, uh, in your overall molecule. So this would be uh, number one, it would be two, right? And we can move these around. It's the nice thing about Kim Draw. It's kind of a magical. All right, and we'll just write a couple more here and move them into place. All right, so there's carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, carbon six, and there's carbon seven. Now, there are eight carbons on the screen, right? There's a carbon right here, okay? Um, but it's not the parent chain, and there's no way that I can number it where I don't get seven as the biggest number I can get, right? I could go one, two, three, four, and that would mean all of this is a functional group. That's not good. I could go one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, that's not good for a reason we'll talk about in a minute. Or I could go one to seven the other way. Also not good. But for now, there, we're going to color it red. Red is my functional group, okay? And at the end of this is a carbon, all right? And it has a CH3, it has three hydrogens attached to it. So whenever you number your carbons, you always want the functional groups to have the lowest possible numbers that they can. So I wouldn't want to number it where starting with a one out here because then I would get one, two, three, four, five for my methyl group. I want to number this one left to right in order to get three as my methyl group. Now, let's just copy this thing over here. All right, we'll write out some more numbers and I'll show you something. Did they give you the CH3 or did you like just add that on there? So I just added it on there. You know it's there, it's implied. So I can erase that. I know that this carbon has to have four bonds. So in a condensed molecule or in a condensed drawing, you don't draw the hydrogens. You just dead end the stick. And everybody knows, hey, that's a carbon right there. But if there's a carbon there, it must have three bonds to hydrogen, right? Remember that if we take this thing, and I think, I think there's a button that will let me do this. Let me see if I can show you the hydrogen. So we'll draw this out and show the hydrogen. So this would be CH3, that's CH2, that's CH, there's CH2, there's CH2, there's CH2, there's a CH3. So remember that with a condensed drawing, we want to get rid of all those hydrogens. So this is really what we're looking at. But in organic, there's no need to draw the H's. We just know that every carbon has four bonds. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Sure, absolutely. So I'm going to get rid of these. Now, I am going to leave the CH3 on the functional group. I'm going to color it red um, just so that we know that, you know, in this PowerPoint or in this demonstration here, whatever you want to call it, um, the things in red are the functional groups. All right. So let's. Back to this 
positive stuff. All right. So what I don't want to do is I don't want to number it from this end because then I get the wrong name. And according to our IUPAC rules, right, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, we know that our functional groups need to be as low as possible. So this would be bad, but that would be fine, right? Do you see that you can just flip it? So do you see what I did there? I just flipped the molecule horizontal. Um, so this would be wrong, right? We've, we've turned it over, okay? But this, this is what we want, all right? So we always want to make sure that our, our substituents, right, our functional groups have the smallest possible number when we name them. Now, some interesting things that the book will show you, um, stuff like this. And I think this is, there we go. All right, and we'll put a double bond in here, just because. All right, so if I want to name something like this, right, um, I've got a cyclo group, I've got a double bond, and I've got two of identical substituents. So um, I'll show you the name. Okay, there is the name. Uh, now let's make sure that we understand why that's the name. So the exact same set of rules that tell us we want um, – our numbers to be the lowest that they can be, okay, uh, tells me that I have, a, I have a, a cyclo group in here, so I need to name my cyclo group. I know I want my substituents to be the lowest number they can, and more importantly, I want that double bond to be the lowest it can be. So I'm going to put carbon number one right here. I'm going to make these two ethyls, oh, sorry, my functional groups, right, because they are sticking off of the um, cyclo group. And so now I'm just going to number it around to figure out how many carbons I have. So there's three, there's number four, let me drop the name down a little bit, five, and six. Now, when I look at the name, this should make sense. I have a 1,4-diethyl. So remember, an ethyl group would come from ethane. Um, so eth means two carbons. So there's ethane, right? Now, I know that just looks like a straight line. Remember, it's got carbons at both ends. Uh, so let's, let's make sure that we're all good on that. So move this out of the way. Show me my carbon. Show me my carbon. Right there. So I have CH3 bonded to CH3. So there's carbon one of the functional group. There's carbon two, and it's obviously hooked into the chain. You don't count that initial carbon. It's part of the cyclo. Um, so I have two ethyls. I have an ethyl at position one. I have an ethyl at position four. So I say one four with a comma in between them, hyphen, diethyl, so two ethyl groups, and then cyclohex. Then I put one ene into the name. Now, I've seen it written different ways. Um, this is the most updated way that we would do that. So right before the ending, which tells us the double bond, uh, we say where the double bond is. Okay, So that would be an interesting molecule. Now, not to be... Not to jump ahead, all right, but just to point out some things that you're going to see as your experience in chemistry is that a lot of compounds have common names, okay? So I'm going to have to zoom out to draw this one, uh, but we're going to actually insert a name here. Uh, we're going to insert vitamin B12. So now I know what you're thinking. Oh, my God, how would I name that? Well, there's a reason we call this vitamin B12, okay? Um, if you actually wanted to name it, uh, a name cannot be generated for that structure. That's pretty much why, okay? 
Um, <laughs> there are a lot of things in organic that, like, I mean, this is a huge molecule. It's got stereospecific bonds, right? It's got, you know, the wedges and the, that's stereospecific, right? The, the sticking up out of the page or the dash bonds going into the page. Um, it's got ring systems. It's got, you know, amide groups and it's got carboxyl groups. It's got all kinds of things. So don't get hung up on if you see some really big molecule, uh, how am I going to name that, right? Uh, if we create, see, should actually give me a name, I think, because I deleted in the middle. Nope, come on, just not. All right, if we just make something crazy, so let's let's just draw a little bit here. So we'll we'll do two benzene rings that are fused. Looks pretty cool. And we'll throw some functional groups on there. Yeah, so this is a really, it's not an overly complicated molecule, um, but it's definitely not pretty. And then we'll actually, we'll build a bridge. So let's bridge this molecule. All right, so that's hideously ugly. All right, but you would get a name like that for that. Okay, so like the naming rules work. They're really useful, um, but don't get hung up on, you know, worrying about really big molecules. We're going to name things like this. Know that there are things like that out there. I don't know that that's a real thing. Uh, but you can name any molecule with those IUPAC rules, all right? Now, one email that I got uh, that we had a question. Um, let see if I can pull that back up real quick. Was about number 62 and 61. All right, so let me, let me see exactly what they asked me. All right, so just as can we go over problems 61 and 62? So absolutely. So let me open up my textbook here. So 61 wants you to do some naming, all right? Um, and when you name these things, so I'll go ahead, I'll do, we'll say we'll do two of them, and then we'll let them figure out the other two. So um, the first molecule looks like this. And they were really nice, and they gave you the carbons. Let's say it's CH3. So there's a carbon there, and a carbon there, and a carbon there. All right. So I actually think them giving you the carbons actually makes this a whole lot more difficult uh, than it needs to be, okay? So the name for this um, is going to be 2-methyl-butene, all right? And let's draw it out with just a condensed molecule. Clean that thing up. All right, so this is actually, I think, um, much easier to name without these pesky carbons and hydrogens in the way, all right? And so in order to do this, we're going to need some numbers because we have to number our bonds, or number our carbons, oh, excuse me. I thought I had to sneeze. I still might, all right? Now, I'm going to start down here. I'm going to go one, two, carbon three, carbon four, okay? Now, that means that this carbon is a functional group, so we're going to color it red. And remember the rules about your functional groups. You want your functional group to have the lowest possible number. So in this case, two instead of three, right? I don't want to start at the top right and go one, two, three, four. I want to start at the bottom left. And I want my double bond to have uh, the low number for when I name it. So at position two, there's a methyl group on a butene chain. So but means four carbons. And on that butene, the double bond is at position two. So one, two, three, four, that's butene, right? Because I have the double bond. And I'm saying at position two is the double bond itself. 
All right? So that's uh, 61A. Now let's do a cool one. Uh, let's do let's do D because uh, I like D. D is an interesting question. So the types of names does it like really matter which way you do it? Because in the book they do it like the like butene in the name, um, but you what, just it, what do you mean in the book? Um, like for example, one of the ones in the book says like two methyl one butene. Oh, okay. So they're doing it. All right. So I got what you're saying. So that this is a more uh, updated way, right? This this software is. Um, if you wrote this two methyl two butene, that's the older way that we wrote things, um, where we would put the this two right here tells you where the double bond is. This two tells you where the methyl group is. Um, I wouldn't mark it wrong. It's just that this is the more accurate way. Uh, and, and you could search, I mean, like if you threw either one of these names into the internet, you're going to get the same compound. Um, they're, they're not so complicated that they're going to give you something different. But uh, just, you know, for clarity's sake, uh, we, like to, we like to use this one. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the twos are representing the same thing, right? Well, so you always put functional groups first and then the dis the numbers that describe where bonds are second. So like in this one, I'll try to highlight it. So this two right here, because it's the first two, is talking about this methyl functional group. So it's saying at the second carbon, there's one methyl group. And then it's saying at position two, the double bond that makes butene butene have that E and E ending, right? Because it's an alkene is at position two. So if I was drawing this from scratch, this is how I would, I would draw it. I would say, okay, I need to draw at position two. So there's position one, position two, I need to draw a methyl group. And then I need to draw two butene. So I'll do it again, just so. So I, I need a methyl group. So I, I draw my first carbon, right? And I know it's going to be on a on a butte structure, right? So four carbons. So one, two, three, four. Position two, I have a methyl group. And starting at position two, going to position three is my double bond. Either one of these tells you how to do it. The top one is just the more updated way. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, so let's name this bad boy. So it is a 3-methyl cyclobute 1E, all right? Now let's see why it's a 3-methyl, not a 1-methyl, because, you know, typically we want our uh, functional groups to have the smallest possible number. And if we look up here at what we did with this one, we said, well, we made that functional group the 1. But the only reason I could do that is because I could, at the same time, make this double bond at position one. I want my double bond to be at position one before I want my um, before I want my triple bond or before I want my functional group brother. Okay, so we're going to take this just around. We're going to say, all right, here's one, two, and we'll go clockwise, three, four, just like that. Okay, so that would be 3-methyl cyclobute 1-ene. All right, so there we go. Okay, so those are both pretty cool molecules. And again, this is my functional group right there. All right, so that's 61. So hopefully that'll help you a little bit with 61. Um, and now the second question I got was, can we look at 62? Absolutely. So when you're generating a a structure, right, like um, 1, 4 diethyl cyclohexane, okay, uh, that's um, one that we, we've actually already done, I just realized I already did that one. Um, when I want to write this from the name, okay, I have to kind of pick the name apart. So it says 1, 4 diethyl 
cyclohexene. Now, in this problem in the book, you can see why we've updated the naming convention a little bit. Um, the book just says this, 1,4-diethyl cyclohexene. Now, it kind of leaves you with the question of, well, okay, where's the, where's the double bond? Um, so I'll draw a hexane in here, or a hexane, rather, in here, just a cyclohexane. Okay, right there. At position one, so I'm just going to call this position one, there is an ethyl group. So if that's one, then we have two, three, and four. So at position four, there's another ethyl group. But then I have to figure out where the double bond goes that makes an ene. And in this case, it, it actually does go at position one. Um, not, not the most descriptive thing anymore. So that's why we want to put those, uh, that one right there that tells us where the bond is. So that would be um, the answer for that one. Clean that up, make it nice and straight. All right. Uh, if we wanted to do, say, the hexine, just because that has a, a triple bond in it, okay, um, we'll just convert that in and then we'll talk about how we got that. So uh, we have two, two, dimethyl, three, hexine. All right. So there's our molecule. Okay. Now let's see if we can go about uh, building it with our numbers. So we'll drop some numbers in here. We need six because it's a hexine. So let's see if we can go about labeling this thing. So um, we go one, two, three right there at the start of my triple bond, four, five, and six. So that's how they're numbering their carbons, right? We've got, um, you know, we want our, our functional groups to have a low number. We also want our, uh, you know, double or triple bond to have a low number. So I could have numbered it the other way, right? We could have said one, two, three, and my YNE, right, my triple bond would have been the same spot, but that puts my functional groups at position five. We can flip it, like do the numbering like this, and we get position one. So if I want to draw this thing out, right, I say, all right, well, I've got a hex, so I need to draw a hexane. So that's how I'll start. So one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, just like that. Clean that thing up. Make it nice and straight. There we go. At position two, I have dimethyl. So that means I have two methyls at position two. So there are my functional groups. All right. And at position three, I have my hex I and I have my triple bond. So one, two, three. So right here, we're going to make that a triple bond. And then we'll hit clean up. And there it is. Okay. And you can see there's a match. So when I take a name and draw a structure, I start with the parent chain, and you kind of read it right to left. So the hexine tells me there's six carbon chain with a triple bond in it at position three. There are two methyl functional groups at position two, all right, both at position two. Now, something interesting, um, in this drawing, I made carbon one right here in the black, right, so it would be like this one. You could also make it here, you could also make it there. It, it actually doesn't matter which one carbon one is, you still have two uh, ethyl groups at position two. All right, and then the last one for this, uh, we'll type this one out. We get two, four, dimethyl, one, octene. All right, here we go. Um, I have an eight chain, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, there's my um, there's my eight membered chain, right for octane. Okay, I know there's a double bond in there. I know at position two and four, I have a methyl group. 
I know in position one, I have a double bond. So we're going to say this is position one, so we're going to make that a double bond. At two, I'm going to have a methyl, and at four. So one, two, three, four. I'm going to have a methyl right there. All right. And there we go. Now, you'll notice slightly different writing. That's okay. It's still the same thing. Optine, optine, right, same thing. Okay, so we'll get rid of that. Let's label our functional groups in red. So that's a methyl group. That's a functional group. That's a functional group. And we'll throw our numbers in there. So there is number one, carbon one, carbon two, three. Four, five, six, seven, and eight. All right, so um, when you're naming, identify your parent chain, identify the location of double or triple bonds, identify the location of functional groups, draw them out. All right, so any other questions that we have for that? as naming goes. Does it matter when you're drawing them if you start um, kind of like on the one you drew, does it matter like which way you start drawing it? If you start drawing it kind of um, I don't know how like vertical it. instead of horizontal? Um, no, just kind of like see how it looks like a mountain. Does it, yeah. does it matter if you draw it like starting? Oh, no. Okay. No, it doesn't matter at all. So remember, molecules are real things. They move in three dimensions. So um, you could rotate this thing. I mean, that this is just as right. That's cool. That's great. Um, okay. All of these would be fine. All right. Hopefully that was a pretty good review of some of the things we looked at in the first video. Um, obviously, there were some good questions that uh, kids had either emailed me before or that even Grace had asked during the middle of the lecture. Um, and since we haven't really had time to do that, I thought it would be helpful for you guys to see some of the questions other people had asked and be able to build on that. Um, if you have any questions about organic, let me know. Shoot me an email. Okay. And next, the next video, we'll look at aromatics and that will wrap up our uh, kind of examination of organic chemistry in this unit. So, uh, again, if you have any questions, send me an email. I'd be glad to give you guys a hand. But other than that, I'll see you in the next video.